This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us. With me is John Cameron in the middle today, and we've got Richard Fields on the other end. And gentlemen, there seems to be a uh, changing tide in how race is viewed in this country, and it's unclear what the end game is. A former exec who, who was fired for being a white man has been awarded $10 million in a wrongful termination lawsuit because he was sued because of the his color of his skin. He was sued because he was the wrong race. And we all believe, you know, race is essentially irrelevant, right? It should be outside of your own personal livelihoods. It should be a rep, your own personal life. Race is irrelevant in public life. It's irrelevant in your job. It's irrelevant in government. It's irrelevant in the justice system. Well, it should be irrelevant in, the, in all these things, but it no longer is. And this is going to be an interesting uh, next few years as these things get settled out because a lot of people have been let go or not let into school, college. We've had recently the colleges have changed their uh, admission standards based upon race. This is a, it's a strange time to be alive. I didn't think I'd see it this way. It's we just I don't know. What do you guys think? John? I think I, I kind of long for the uh, the years of Martin Luther King, who uh, had a dream that uh, everybody would be treated equal. And uh, that's my, you know, that's that's our position as well. Uh, and equality is not good enough anymore. We have to somehow or another make up for the uh, perceived wrongs of generations past. And if we do that, then the the current generations are uh, saying, "Hey, wait a minute! Don't uh, you know? Don't make don't use me as a sacrificial lamb." Which is kind of the the situation with the white guy working for uh, uh, this you know large company. Uh, you know they uh, in a, in a you know in a in a in a fair uh, unjust or a fair just non-politicized uh, world if a company wanted to uh, increase its uh, minority participation participation for whatever reason we would have no objection to it but when they are forced to do it by the government that's another story and likewise uh, when he sues to get his job back in a normal situation we'd say well the company made a decision was it because you were incompetent or because you're, you're the wrong skin color it's, it's really not really not our concern uh, because uh, it's between you and the company, and there are plenty of companies out there that won't discriminate upon race, and those are the companies who are going to get the most qualified people because precisely because they don't discriminate on, on, on racial grounds or any other grounds. They look for the best talent. They look for the best, the hardest working people. Well, yeah, I, I, I would like to see uh, people be colorblind in hiring what, what annoys me is that these institutions are violating um, court decisions that say they can't do this stuff, and they're doing it anyway. I mean, there's been many Supreme Court cases that have said that, that you know, colleges can't uh, base their admissions upon race, can't favor one race over another. There's uh, f employment law is, is full of cases that say you can't, you can't either hire because of race or fire because of race. You can't give preference to people because of race, uh, and and they do it anyway. And um, you know that's the difference between you know these large institutions, and they're all kind of government run. Because like I think this was a medical, wasn't this a medical company where this case was from? I don't. Can we mention the name of the company? No, we could if I could read it on my it's screen like here. Norvo, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so the the I read a little bit bit of the background on it, and and the company says they fired the guy because he um, he delegated critical parts of his duties, and they fired him because of performance. And I was always taught and and discovered that um, you know you're supposed to delegate critical parts of your job. That's the way you grow managers, and that's the way you get more done. You find people that can do it, and then you delegate things to them that they they can't that they can do and you can do, so you can do things they can't do. And um, and then they replaced him with two people. So uh, apparently he was so incompetent that um, that it, that it that they actually needed two people to do his job, which I found kind of confusing as well. Now the case is in, uh, a jury found it in North Carolina. I don't know where, where North Carolina cases get appealed 
um, probably the Supreme um, Court in North Carolina. What circuit will it go to? Do you do you remember? No, I don't. I don't know. If, yeah. Whatever. I don't know if it was a federal case or a state case. It was Novant, not Novant. Yes, yeah. it's Novant Health. So it was a health uh, health industry, and Novant was the actual name of the company. Okay. Just so we get it clear. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so it'll get appealed somewhere because the company's not going to um, hold on. Let me, let me either talk loud or mute myself. That alarm will be off in just a second. I could, I could. thank you, alarm person. Appreciate it. Um, all right. Wasn't that loud? I could hear it. Anyway, um, yeah, it's going to get appealed and, you know, the, the, the lawyers will make a ton of money and who knows where, where it will stand because, you know, labor law is uh, – you know, typically the the person um, filing the lawsuit has an edge. You know, judges and juries like to look on companies as evil, and uh, you know, and and so if they can find in favor of the person, then um, you know they'll do so. In most cases like that, are settled out of court. So. Um, you know, nobody wants their dirty laundry. No corporation wants their dirty laundry aired in, in a courtroom. Usually the lawyers make a ton of money and then they come to a settlement and it never reaches court. So it'll be re really interesting to follow this down the road and, and see what happens. But I, I found the company's comments and its hiring policy really entertaining and that uh, they, they fired him for delegating critical parts of his job, which... That's how you grow a business. You delegate to good people. And that when they replaced this incompetent guy, they replaced him with two people. So that's that's interesting as well. Yeah, so the incompetence angle doesn't hold up. And as someone who has, has an interracial family and whose grandchildren are even more interracial than that, I find this whole modern view of race to be disturbing. And that actually brings us on to our, our next issue. There was a recent study, and it says more than a third of white students lie about their race on college applications. Now, why would white students, if they have all the benefits in the world, lie about their race in college applications? They're, they're if, emulating Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, that's true, because a lot of them were choosing Native American. They were saying they have some Native American somewhere. And, well, I, in the modern world, how can you just prove it? What are you going to do? 20, make them take 20, a DNA test? and me would, would give you a pretty good indication. Yeah. Well, I, I, I always thought I, I, my, my, my father always told the tale about being part Indian and using, I think he used that for one of his excuses about where he, where he acted so strangely when he had fire water. And, um, and it turned out after the 23 and me thing, I was whiter than rice. So, um, but it's, it's funny that 48% of, of uh, white males will, will identify as uh, Native American. And um, uh, white females identify, 15% uh, of them will identify as, as black, whereas only 8% of males. So when they lie, they pick different things to lie about. And I find that interesting as well. And then it goes back to why would they lie on these applications? Well, they're lying on them because the, the schools they're applying to are violating all the laws that have been heard in all these courts over the past 30 years about racial hiring preference. And they're hiring based on racial or letting people in school based on racial preference. Now, anytime one of these courts gets to one of these cases gets to an appeals court, or, or the Supreme Court, the court says, bad school. Here's the law. You know it was the law. You can't do this. And then they keep doing it. So, anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's nationwide. It certainly is in California with uh, Prop 209 uh, that uh, you're not supposed to discriminate on race. But, of course, colleges do regardless. Uh, and, and, you know, and it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's another way of in, inserting race as uh, uh, a, a trump card or an excuse. A trump card if you think you need it because you're not competent enough to get in, or an excuse if you uh, fail to get in. Uh, well, uh, that's because they were, uh, you know, against me because of my race. Uh, I think people, you know, we, th we libertarians think people should stand on their own merits, their own ability, their own talent, their own industriousness. And uh, race should entirely be uh, a non-factor. A non whether it's college admissions or hiring or any other uh, form of uh, 
uh, interaction between people. Well, and I think I think it goes it goes deeper than hiring. The 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 two the duopoly that we have in this country, and we've talked about this over and over again on the show, relies on on fear from its 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 core voters in order to get elected and stay elected and get power. And, and if the uh, regressives, I refuse to call them what they self-identify as, didn't have uh, a bunch of people focusing on, on race being told over and over and over again that the reason they're not making it is because of their race and their prejudice and they need these programs and they need a bunch of uh, highly educated, overpaid white people to run these programs to help them, then um, they wouldn't be in power. And, and so anytime they can stir the pot with a race card, they stir it um, so that they can, can maintain their power and grow it. And, yeah, and, and it's, not, that's not a, it's not a monopoly of the left. The, no, no. I, I refuse to call them conservatives. I call them preservatives. Uh, the preservatives have uh, used race baiting uh, since uh, Reconstruction times. Uh, the uh, uh, anti-miscegenation laws, blacks can't marry whites were a direct result of the people, politicians of the time, trying to stoke fears of uh, racial minorities, uh, blacks in that particular case. Uh, and in fact, our, our marriage license laws are a direct result of the miscegenation fear. Uh, people have to get a marriage license to make sure uh, in Southern states, they had to get a license to make sure that they were uh, of the same race. Otherwise, uh, they couldn't get a license, couldn't get married. That went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, in the Loving case, not. And not, not not that many decades ago, actually. Well, and it doesn't end there. We can go. Uh, Martin Luther King couldn't get a, a a gun permit, a permit for a gun, for this very reason, because you know our gun control laws are meant to keep keep guns out of those you know the, the ex slaves or the downtrodden. They're not meant for the the rich and the powerful. They can always get around these laws. They don't have a problem with it. It's the average person. It's the underclasses that get their rights stumped. It's not the rich and the powerful. It never does. They always claim it's going to. We're going to even the score, but it never evens the score, does it? it we always, it's always the little guy who gets, who gets the boot on his neck, not the big and powerful guys. Yeah, the, whether, you want it, whether it's a racial minority or a, uh, a socioeconomic minority, or it's, it's, it is by definition minorities. Uh, that are uh, used and abused by majorities. And whether the majority is racist or whether the majority is uh, white supremacist or whether the majority, whatever the majority is, they try, majorities try to impose their will on minorities. That's the problem. And of course, that case, the, the, uh, the gun case is going to the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. They're going, uh, they're, people are challenging the uh, Sullivan laws in New York, which of course are uh, laws which say that in order to carry a handgun, you, uh, uh, you have to get a license and the license issuance is a may issue a license on the part of the uh, sheriff or the gendarme, whoever it is, has the, ability, has the ability to issue licenses. They are not required to issue a license if there's no reason not to. They are given discretion, discretionary power, whether they feel like giving a license. And of course, uh, most gendarmes, most judges, most uh, uh, people in positions of power feel like giving a license to people that look like them, whoever that might be, not mm -hmm. to people that uh, other, that they're afraid of or that they might, or they think that uh, their uh, their constituents might be afraid of. One, it, yeah, I, I agree with Richard. Um, I think that's twice on this show. That might be a record. Um, and um, the, the, all the gun laws were, were the furor and fear about uh, um, all the crime in, in black and Italian uh, areas of New York is how they've managed to, you know, push through these extreme anti-gun measures. And, and you know, the, the, what's nice to see is, is uh, there's some, some good and the bad in this court case that Richard was talking about. Uh, a number of, of black um, uh, organizations, uh, black legal organizations, Black Guns Matter, and others have, have come forward. There's there's a, a strong history in this country of people, oppressed minorities, arming themselves to protect themselves. You know, like after the Civil War, uh, you know, Black communities, especially in the South, people were heavily armed so that they could protect themselves from racist whites. 
And so in, you know, um, people who are poor and in areas where there's high crime uh, have a greater need for weaponry. And these are the people who are being denied over and over again their ability to defend themselves. Now, the, the shameful part of this was until, I think, 2014, the uh, NAACP was a big promoter of gun rights, especially for um, black people. But, um, you know, that worm has turned, and now they're of the opinion that, that uh, you know, people having guns to defend themselves adds to crime. Whereas all of the studies, all of the good studies... Uh, all, all of the empirical studies. All of the empirical studies... Um, I don't know it's empirical, but the, all the studies indicate that, again, uh, more guns, less crime. And, you know, if you, if you want to see what happens in, in a society where we're a murderous people, the people in the United States of America, even if you take out all the gun crime and homicides and all the rest of this, um, uh, and we'd still be more murderous than just about any other country, except for some of the, the you know, drug warfare countries in South America and some of the the uh, uh, interreligious warfare that's going on in, in some of the eastern countries. And and um, so, you know, the guns are, are you know, they, but in England, um, which is thought of as very peaceful, they're having, especially in London, a ton of knife crime. They're, they're having people go after each other with machete, which uh, each other with machetes, they're having people on motorbikes do thefts and they're holding, you know, a big knife in their hand and all the rest of that. And also many of the home invasions that happen in countries with, uh, with very low rates of, of gun ownership or just somebody big and brawny kicking in the front door and coming in and taking stuff. Because if they don't face a little old lady holding a 45 or somebody with a shotgun, what do they care? They can overpower and overwhelm whoever might be in that house, but not if that person has a gun in their hand. So, and then the other the other part of society that's kept from gun ownership are, are felons in this country. And you know, it, it seems to me if if you if you you know if you do the crime and serve your time, you shouldn't be punished going forward. But most of these people can't get high end jobs. They have to li live in if they get jobs at all, they have to live in low income areas that are high in crime but they are precluded from owning a firearm. And if they're found with one as a felon, a former felon, somebody who was in prison as a felon, then that's a felony. And they go back into prison for simply trying to, to, to defend themselves. It's ludicrous and, and time for this stuff. The Supreme Court needs to do the right thing to get rid of these laws, like most states have. Most states are, are in this country are now getting rid of any kind of carry laws. And that's a great thing. And we've talked about minority rights. Um, recently, it, the from the NBA, Enos Cantor, I believe is how you pronounce his name, mm -hmm. has called out Michael Jordan, Nike, the NBA, LeBron James, for their stance on human rights when it comes to slave labor in China. Uh, the We talked about the, what is it? The, I always mispronounce this, the Uyghur population. Is it, did I get that one right? Sounds, about, know, sounds right to me. Yeah, they're, they're, they're people of Muslim descent in far uh, western China, far western provinces of China. And it's a real thing. I mean, the Chinese have been uh, using and abusing uh, Uyghurs uh, in a essentially a form of, of slave labor uh, for, you know, for decades now. And uh, at the same time, trying to destroy their their culture, making them assimilate to the uh, uh, Eastern Han Chinese culture, uh, whether they want to or not. And so it's a real thing that uh, uh, a real evil that China is perpetrating. And the, the fallout's very interesting. A coach in the NBA uh, made a statement uh, uh, against the Chinese, uh, against the Chinese, the, the People's Republic uh, leadership over, I think, Hong Kong. And he was forced to issue, uh, the NBA gets a huge amount of, it's the National Basketball Association for your non-sports people, gets a huge amount of advertising revenue and, and purchase of goods and all the rest of that from China. And um, the, the Chinese government went up in arms when, when this guy said something about uh, their treatment of people in Hong Kong. 
and he was forced to make an apology on on uh, on air, or actually sent out a kind of a press release, a tweet, or something. And uh, uh, LeBron James and a couple of other these big stars came out and said, "Oh no, no, we love China. We love China. We love China." It was basically China's good. We love China. So what happens is, uh, if if you say anything bad against China, uh, they hit the NBA in the pocketbook. So this Enos Kanter plays for the uh, Boston Celtics. When he came out and said this. Uh, he was talking about uh, Hong Kong and the Uyghurs, whatever they are. I'm going to have to look up how to pronounce this because we're going to talk about them in the future and I'd like to say their name right. They uh, stopped televising um, Boston Celtic games, so hit to the income stream. We'll see what the NBA does, you know, because they were, um, you know, they were certainly very supportive of, uh, of people rightfully calling out some racial injustice in this country. But when you uh, point it out in foreign countries and it affects, affects your, uh, your income stream, that's another thing. Now, e Enos Cantor is not what you call a champion of overall uh, human rights because he's actually uh, a big supporter of the guy that Erdogan, Erdogan whatever the current uh, ruler of Turkey, uh, had, had uh, an Erdogan. ally. Hmm? Hmm? Erdogan. Erdogan. He had an ally that turned into an enemy, uh, and this guy's, you know, pretty right-wing crazy, and Mr. Cantor is a big supporter of him. So, you know, he's picking and choosing his battles as we all do. So it, it'll be see, it'll be interesting to see what the NBA does. Well, and what's interesting to me is that Chinese are essentially uh, censoring the NBA. Uh, they're saying if you don't, if you uh, say nasty things about us, which are true. But but not not complimentary. We will censor your uh, your 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 games. Uh, you won't be uh, seen or heard in China, uh, and you'll pay the financial consequences uh, of that censorship. At the same time, we have a couple of uh, you know. Uh, essentially all of the large social media companies in the United States, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and the you know, Pinterest, uh, and uh, Instagram, I don't know. Who, uh, the only two I follow are, are in LinkedIn. They're, they're all saying that if you say something wrong about uh, a, a virus that we've uh, been ex dealing with for the last year, or if you say something wrong about uh, racism or whatever it is, uh, you will get canceled. You will get, uh, which is censorship. Uh, mm -hmm. And that censorship is taking place not because necessarily the companies want to, although many of them probably do, but it's really taking place because the U.S. government is calling their leadership in front of Congress on a regular basis, threatening regulation, dire, far-reaching, anti-monopoly regulation, and the, uh, regulation to the extent that their business models would be severely impacted. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. government is telling these companies, you either kowtow to what we think should be uh, done in the way of censorship or bye-bye to your business model. So mm -hmm. China, U.S., both are practicing the, the same thing. Now, arguably, the, uh, the Chinese uh, abuse of the Ubers is a heck of a lot worse than anything that's going on in the United States, but it's still censorship, and it's it's uh, and free speech is the uh, the uh, the transparency or provides the transparency and provides the uh, the sunlight that prevents and ameliorates a lot of bad things. And mm -hmm. the, to the extent that we get of uh, get rid of free speech and freedom of press, it's to our own and to the Chinese own uh, detriment. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree on that. That, um, that I think that you know the governments of, of China have a huge amount of power, and the governments of the United States has a huge amount of power. Uh, and and I goes back to it. You know, the uh, people don't do bad things; governments do bad things. Now, people, individuals do, but massive bad things are done by massive bureaucrats. Massive, massive government. And we're gonna we got just a few minutes left, and I want to get onto one more story. Um, Americans are now preferring a smaller government, which is part of the solution to all of this madness we've been talking about here all day, all show long. It's just, but the question is, are they going to get it? Are either of these crowds, either are the Team Blue or Team Red, going to give us smaller government? The answer is no, because uh, historically, whenever people are afraid of something, whether it's COVID or whether it's 9-11 uh, or whether it's uh, the uh, the Red Menace during the Cold War or whether it's the uh, 
the Nazis and the Japanese during World War II or whether it's uh, economic uh, depression during the 1930s, whenever people are afraid of something, they run to government and say, help us, help us, uh, protect us from this evil. Uh, a majority of Americans do that. And so the government politicians say, okay, we'll do whatever we can to protect you. When the evil passes, those regulations, those laws, those infringements on liberty, they stay by and large. And all of the uh, infringements on liberty since 9-11, the terror, you know, the Patriot Act and so forth, uh, the, uh, you know, security theater at airports, all of that stuff is staying. Likewise, all of the, uh, the medical uh, regimentation will stay as a result of the latest scare. Uh, politicians use fear to ratchet up the power of the state. I think uh, the, the book of Leviathan said it best. I, I, and I think, I think that uh, there's a little bit different take on it. The, they do use fear, but I don't think necessarily that, that people go running to the government. I think what the government does is a very good job of, of finding out whatever it is. In this case, it's the, the, the um, you know, the fear of 9-11 and, the fear of, of, a, of a virus and all the rest of that to completely take charge of the economy and inflate money even more than it is. But I think it's not necessarily people running the government. I think it's government preying on those fears and then, uh, you know, spend an awful lot of money uh, magnifying those fears so that people believe uh, because they're so easily swayed that uh, that government has a solution. And I would suggest that anybody that's looked at, at uh, the last hundred years of government in this country and thinks that any solution promulgated by a bunch of bureaucrats, which entitles them to even more power than they've already taken, uh, and, and anybody that agrees with that is, is stupid uh, because history doesn't bear them out. There is some interesting stuff about, um, you know, people in this country generally want to be left alone, but they don't want to leave other people alone. And exactly. that was, uh, well, I think all of us read a very nice reason article. It's okay to pitch reason because they do such wonderful work about this. You know, people on, on the left uh, want to be left alone to smoke dope. And I see no reason why not. If you're having a drink, why not have a joint too? Uh, they want to be left alone for, you know, uh, to, to uh, use whatever birth control or, in whatever fetal life they want, you know that's a, a theory, that's a moral religious discussion. People on the on the on the right want to be left alone so that they can carry their firearm wherever they want, and they want to choose not to take the the, the vaccine that other people want. But um, they they don't want to they want to be left alone themselves, but they want to control how other people act. And that's once we get rid of that, we'll have some real freedom in this country. Well, John, there was a time and there was a time when this country started where fear of government led to a to a theory of smaller government. And we can hope that the fear of government is what's leading us to a next rebirth of smaller government. But with that, it is our time is up. We want to thank you for joining us. And please remember from Team Counterpoint to love everybody. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.